So hello and welcome to the 2022 IndyCar season preview. I'm delighted to have joining me Pato O'Wall, Jack Harvey and Callum Eilock to look ahead at the 2022 IndyCar season that of course starts at St. Pete later this month with coverage live on Sky Sports F1. We'll also be talking to the Race.com's resident IndyCar expert, Jack Benyon, hearing his thoughts on what was a vintage year in 2021 and looking ahead to 2022. So, Pato, it's been a busy winter for you, hasn't it? Tell us what you've been up to, and you've got a new watch as well. Yeah, man, it's uh, it hasn't been bad at all. Uh, got a... <clears throat> got a fresh watch on the wrist a few days ago, which was really nice. Um, and just trying to stay active, man. Uh, I've been eating a lot. So that's definitely had to slow down in, in terms of, of having to stay within my, my weight range. Uh, and I got to test the Formula One car before Christmas, which uh, that's probably the best present I could ever ask for. And, and yeah, man, just ready to go. So in terms of testing being at a premium in IndyCar, how much has that extra seat time been of value to you? It's huge, man. It's huge and it's a lot of seat time. I mean, in a 24-hour race, I think I ended up doing like uh, a, a little less than seven hours. So that's that's quite a bit of, of seat time that just, you know, I wouldn't get in IndyCar because I think we have one day in Sebring before St. Pete and, and that's it. Um, you know, obviously not even counting the, the, the many kilometers that I got to do in the F1 car. I think it was a, a little bit over 500 K. So, um, so yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's been a great off season, probably the best I could ever ask for. Um, what was more challenging the the 24 mm -hmm. the formula one car? I mean, obviously physically the formula one car is a challenge, but the, mentally and physically the 24 must be so difficult as well. Yeah, the, man, the, 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 the hardest thing about the 24 um, is that at night, whenever you have those, uh, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't raining because the, the tail lights on the cars are so bright that whenever the rain light is on, man, you can't see where you're going because they're so bright. Um, but even when they hit the brakes, they still turn on. So when people get on the brakes and you get to like a part where the bus stop is, where there's not a lot of light, mate, you can't see anything. You can't see the curb or anything. So you just kind of like feel what the car is doing. Um, but I think that's the most difficult, just not making mistakes at night. And I got the graveyard stint. I went from, uh, from 1 a.m. to 4, so I got the... I got the the one that is probably darkest. <laughs> I can imagine. So I'm just going to bring in Jack. So whilst Pato was doing his graveyard shift at the Rolex 24, what what were you doing, Jack? You've got arguably the 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 perfect platform for 2022. A new team, lots to look forward to. How have you been preparing? Well, I was sleeping probably when Pat was doing his shift and watching the highlights in the morning, uh, in all fairness. But obviously, congratulations to him, Colton, and Devlin for getting off to the season on such a good start. And obviously, representing Honda, Aki again, a one-two was a, a great way for everybody to get started. So, um, <clears throat> so I say my off-season's mostly been in the US uh, with COVID and whatnot kind of changed through my travel pants. So I've been here the whole time. And I wish I had a slightly more ungeneric answer but it's just been a lot of time with the team obviously a new team for me joining RLL this coming season so if anything I spent more time with them just to try and build a relationship and rapport with all the guys the girls on the team my engineers all my crew guys um kind of aside from racing I've been going clay pigeon shooting quite a lot just because it's a hobby of mine that I let slip there for a little bit and wanted to get back on track with that but uh yeah to be honest I really enjoyed the off season and you know the same as all three of us are going to say today obviously we're just excited that it's race month and we just want to get to St. Pete and get started and are you still based in Indianapolis uh yeah just on the north side actually I think me and Pat only live about a mile away from each other there's like this little hub now it feels like your drivers are in this like mile and a half radius of each other and talking uh, about Brits and Indianapolis I'm going to bring Callum in now Callum <laughs> you're moving to to Indianapolis, I think tomorrow or, or Saturday, am I right in saying? Saturday, yeah, no. Uh, I got my visa done last week, so I'm all ready to go. But a bit, bit back and forth, really. It's been a little bit stressful with the traveling, but it's nice. 
And Pato, if you had any advice for Callum moving to the US, what would that be based on, on, on your experiences? Uh, ooh. Well, compared to Europe, I think the, the quantity of food whenever you order at a restaurant is going to be massive. Um, so that's probably going to be new. And mate, I think you're going to really enjoy it because it's a very competitive but very friendly environment and i think it really it you know to be honest i've really really enjoyed um you know you enjoy kind of messing around with your competitors but when you're on the track it's it's super super competitive so i, I think you're going to have a lot of fun and on that point callum you've obviously <laughs> done three races what's been the biggest difference in the indycar paddock to say the formula one paddock for you so far Ah, I mean, there's there's quite a few. I, in a general sense, the, the openness of the paddock. I mean, it's so hard normally to get a pass for Formula One, whereas IndyCar, you can walk straight in. Uh, the fact that all the cars, the covers are off, you can, as a fan, just come right close to the driver, right close to the car. I think it just adds a bit more of a purist motorsport side. You know, um, for the fans, it's brilliant. For the drivers, I'd say it's a very intense weekend. Uh, the car is intense, very, very drifty, slidey, um, almost like a 700 horsepower go-kart in my opinion. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's a reason why uh, the drivers love it. And yeah, it's just enjoyable, different atmosphere, um, different type of people uh, and a very pure type of racing. And you might have to get used to the snow living in Indianapolis as well. Uh, Pato, it's snowing well, right now, mate. <laughs> Pato's not got that problem in Texas right now, have you? Yeah, we're uh, we're not snowing, but it's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's look forward to 2022, Pato. You talked um, in the content <clears throat> days about consistency. So you had us on the edge of our seats so often in 2021, and you were so close to the title. In terms of your 2022 title charge, you were really quick on the ovals last year. When you talk about consistency, when you're not winning where do you see that playing out and what do you want to improve uh, yeah man i mean honestly i feel like whenever whenever we had a great weekend we had a really really good weekend but whenever we had a bad weekend we uh, we had a horrendous weekend so i feel like we just we just need to bring that back up a little bit you know we don't have to win them all because frankly in indycar it's impossible to win them all but you can definitely make the bad ones a little bit better. So I think that's that's a, my biggest goal in terms of what I can do better to try and help the team. Um, and, I, and I know the team is trying to to give me tools, tools to be able to do that because, you know, there's, there's you know, frankly been some times where we were just nowhere. So um, I think that's just the beauty of IndyCar that it's so many different disciplines, short ovals, super speedways. Uh, street courses, road courses. There's so many different uh, types of race tracks that you have to be good at. Um, but it's just the name of the game is sometimes you just you're not going to nail it right on the point. So um, you know that's that's what makes a championship so competitive. And 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 that's why I mean you see guys leading the champ, three, four different guys leading the championship, starting the season and then mid season and then at the end of the season. Um, I think this year is going to be no different. It's probably going to be even tougher. And the team and yourself are growing. What's it like to, to sort of take on the might of Team Penske or Andretti or Rahal? What, what does that feel like when you're going to the circuits together? It, you're fairly new in your journey, aren't you? You've got a lot to learn. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's still so much that I, that I, that I feel like I have to learn. Um, but I have, a, I have a good base of knowing what to expect in certain racetracks, um, I mean, we were so close to the 500 last year. Uh, we were very close to the championship. Uh, we got multiple poles. We got multiple wins. So I think, you know, the, the, we, we've checked off the, the main boxes, but now the big cookies are the ones left. So I think um, what we have to do is not change so much of what we have been doing, but just keep pushing and trying to find and trying to analyze uh, the little bits and pieces that we might gain, we might gain here and there because, man, the margins in IndyCar make up for so much, either over a race or for a qualifying. I mean, two tenths can probably move you up eight positions sometimes. So 
Um, so yeah, man, I mean, I think it's all about just trying to see where we can get better and, and finding those little bits. And how closely do you work with Chevrolet? Obviously a new engine coming in 2023, the Chevrolet versus Honda rivalries ebbed and flowed since 2012. What are Chevrolet doing to improve this year? Or is it all eyes on 2023? I'm sure you've been asked that already. Uh, I mean, what I, you know, that, that, that was certainly was, I feel like the, the mindset maybe, you know, at the beginning of last year, but, but what I was stressing a lot was that we, we can't throw away two years. We, we have, we have a shot. We don't know what 23 is going to be like, and we have a shot at, you know, finding the championship at 21. So we need to push, we need to push and we need to find more, uh, to, to fight against the other guys. It's just, that's how it goes. Um, so I certainly hope that we've made some upgrades and improvements for this year. Um, and, and we'll see, but, you know, I, I know that they've been working tirelessly in, in trying to find little bits and in, in, in pieces here and there, because, you know, I know that they know that, you know, we were, we were a bit uh, below where we should have been, you know, in, in certain places. So I well, listen, Pato, thanks so much for your insight. You definitely give 100% when you're in the car, so I'm sure nothing will change in 2023. I'm just going to move to, to Jack. Jack, we've talked about limited testing on this call. It's a new team for you. How much can you gel and integrate with the team with having a limited amount of time in the car? And how many days will you actually get before you go to St. Pete? Uh, well, I'm scheduled to do one day at Sebring. Uh, I think our first test is uh, February 14th. Uh, I think a lot of the cars are going to be there or be there on the day after. So, yeah, it's been mentioned already that IndyCar testing right now seems very sparse. Uh, you know, they're few and far between, which, uh, you know, heading to a new team obviously puts some pressure in just different areas, really. It's just a lot more time, you know, in the actual, in the factory, talking with the guys, trying to look at video analysis, data analysis, and then obviously trying to spend as much time on the uh, Honda simulator as we get opportunity to. So in a lot of ways, again, it's no different than in some other uh, series and things like that. But I think Pato hit the nail on the head already. IndyCar is so competitive right now that, you know, there probably isn't one area that someone can make a 20% improvement, but there might be 10 areas you can make a 1% improvement. Uh, and that's really just been our focus as well. So, I mean, coming to... RLL, obviously, they want me to be in a team to, you know, contribute in a strong way. And I think it's fair to say the last two seasons, we've had some really great potential, but we just haven't maximized it often enough. And that really was the primary reason for making a change. Um, hopefully, we bond together really well because we've got one day to figure it out before it matters. And uh, I really got on well with all the guys and girls on the team. They've been really welcoming. I like the direction the team's heading obviously building a brand new race shop and not that that makes them a better race team, but it certainly shows the intent that they're putting behind their motorsports program. And honestly, at this point, just want to get started. St. Pete has been kind to us in the past. We qualified on the front row there last year. So yeah, I feel right now that we're in a, as good a position as anybody to go and compete and, uh, you know, compete for a win at St. Pete. And that's uh, certainly the goal. And, you know, we'll give it everything we can from here from here to then to try and make that happen. And you've talked about improving how you look after those front tyres. Was it the sticker reds, certainly, that, that you, you want to improve? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I destroyed them ones in St. Pete Race last year, mate. I, um, yeah, I think the first 20 laps, I think that was actually a safety car, and that kind of hurt us a bit. But I think at the, the start of last season, I was a bit hard on the, uh, on the reds, so at least on the front tyres anyway. And, I think that was actually something we improved throughout last season. It was just a couple of driving style changes that I had to make just to try and uh, save them a little bit more. And I think at the end of last season, you know, I think our race pace was, a, you know, about as strong as anybody's really. So uh, I'm really happy with the progress that I made throughout last season. Obviously need to bring that forward, you know, with me to a new team as well. But certainly when we get to St. Pete, looking after my, uh, looking after my Reds a little better than I did in the race, last year will be uh, key because I think in all fairness, if our red stint had, in the last, last five laps anyway, if they'd have been a little bit better, I think we'd have had a, a podium. So um, 
I think that's a nice thing is, you know, for as much potential as we had last year, there's still areas that we, you know, we know we need to work on and improve on and I need to work on and improve at. So um, I love St. Pete. I think it's a great season opener. The weather's usually good. You get to drive right through the, uh, by the bay and the harbour there. So I think it's a, it's an exciting time, but I might have to uh, coin Drifty Slidey from Callum later at some point this season. I, I like that a little bit Drifty Slidey. So Probably going to drop that in one of my uh, reports at some point. Yeah, that won't help the tire wear, mate. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> for the um, rears, it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Look at that drifty sliding. Uh, I, I think you know the, the last question for me is obviously you had your knees and elbows out last year. You, you, you I think you burst onto the scene. It's first fair to say um, you, you showcased how much talent you've got and your potential. Realistically, what are your goals this year? Where do you see you finishing and uh, what do you want to achieve? Uh, I mean, sorry, mate, it's so difficult. It's such a competitive series. If you look at just the drivers on the list, you would say that, you know, a weekend when you're in the top five or the top 10 is a, you know, great effort. There's so many, you know, great drivers, great teams. So, it's tough to say, but I think the thing I try to explain to people is I, I feel like that, you know, aggressive driving has always been there, but I haven't been in a position where, you know, you can go out and just drive like that every weekend because, you know, if we, if we crash the car, you know, that might have meant us not going to the next race, uh, you know, and being with a new team and, you know, realistically still a little bit underfunded. Uh, it really changed my mindset, it changed the team mindset. You know, and 21 was really the first time where we had total freedom to just go and drive without any pressure. And, you know, if we did end up getting into a, uh, you know, drifty slidey into another competitor or something like that, then we were still going to the next race. And I think that's what allowed me the freedom, you know, to really just go out there and honestly just be myself. And that was what I wanted to show last year that, you know, we could race uh, hard and fair with people and, I think that's the respect that a lot of the drivers try and take. And like Pato already mentioned earlier, there is a, a certain level of camaraderie between the guys here that you don't get in Europe. But I can tell you when the helmet goes on, that camaraderie goes away and it's just, uh, you know, a fierce, fierce battle. So, I mean, I think the goals for the season is really just hit our potential. I think if, if we hit our potential, then we'll, you know, put ourselves in the winner's column, you know, a couple of times this year. And uh, the series is so tough that, you know, you have to be good at, uh, you have to really make your good weekends count and your bad weekends not count. But, uh, you know, certainly to compete for wins. And if you can do that, then something good might happen at the end of the season. But uh, I think right now, our, our mindset as a team is whatever the next time we're on track is the most important. So right now it's our Sebring test. After that, it'll be St. Pete. And, you know, we'll just keep ticking through the weekends that way. So, um, yeah, we're just very, very next weekend focused. Thank you, Jack. Well, listen, I think I'm uh, right in saying that you've got a lot of fans back here in the UK that will be cheering you on to Victory Lane, mate. So uh, thanks for chatting and we wish you wish you all the best. On to another Brit, Callum. Have you been writing notes, mate? I've been trying to, keeping the mental, mental <laughs> notes. No, to be fair, Jack was really helpful when I was... Uh, I think we were close to the rear at Laguda. No offence, Jack, but um, no, he was quite helpful with some suggestions and stuff, so... Um, no, yeah, I don't mean to offend you, mate, but it was a bad weekend. No, you, I it, think that one. It, it's, it's a pretty fair representation of how it went. Callum, one car entry. I think I'm right in saying you've not got access to a big simulator either. The only simulator you've got or have had access to is at home. How do you possibly prepare yourself for the might of IndyCar, taking on the big names, uh, both drivers and teams, with the limited running that you've got? I mean, obviously, the team are really serious with what they're doing. You're a big talent, but you've got an uphill mountain to climb, it's fair to say. Yeah, I think I'm in a very different position to, to the others in this one. But um, yeah, we've got a, a massive uh, mountain to climb, as you say. So yeah, really starting from the bottom, um, especially the last uh, three races we did last year. It was a tough, tough learning curve. At least I got an experience for it. Um, yeah, but going into it, they've they've developed a lot over the winter, so we should have a much much better starting platform at least. Um, but the expectations are yeah, massively, massively different. And like you said, 
the simulator has been an interesting one and obviously it's all new tracks for me um especially going in at the start and then the new experience with the ovals i believe at some point hopefully before the first race should get some experience with the chevrolet uh simulator and get on with that uh but at the moment it's been very much you know i racing and stuff uh but luckily that's a that's a good platform for all of this so no, it's, it's been it, it's been a strange one, very different to all the European stuff. Um, and with the diversity of the tracks and how bumpy it can be, and like you said, the limited testing, it's not easy, but I get a few more days and, than the others uh, to try and make it work. And yeah, the winter's just been spent working on myself, trying to get to know the team. Uh, obviously, we've had quite a few changes in the winter from from the free races that we did and yeah try and make the most out of it but let's see what we can do i think saint pete being a street circuit means it's a bit more open but yeah we should we should have some good results throughout the throughout the year have you got any fillings because you might lose them on some of those bumps mate it's so bumpy out there especially coming from from the european paddocks as well and the, and the formula one scene it's going to be a big difference well the way i would describe it is the uh the street circuits in Europe are like the normal circuits in, in the US. It's so bumpy, even Sebring. I, I mean, there, it's probably not even the worst. I think Detroit's probably the worst from what I understand. But yeah, Sebring, I was just like, it's such a different approach um, and you've got to adapt yourself to it. Uh, you've got to get the car towards a point that you like to be comfortable and then to, to adapt yourself around the bumps. But yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting for the back and for the teeth, that's for sure. And the headache. Have you been training hard over the winter? Because a lot's been said about the physicality of the Indy car, especially at places like Barber. Um, it's hard work. When you first drove the car, I mean, let's be brutally honest here. We're amongst friends. When you first drove the car, were, were you surprised? Uh, not really, because it's very similar to the F2 in the weight and the... Uh... Yeah, the the structure of the car. Um, it's just obviously a bit more power and yeah, a larger rear. The the thing that was a bit surprising for me was the amount that I could slide the car. So that's where I think maybe some people with a bit more of an aggressive driving style end up tiring their arms out because they're constantly fighting um, fighting the car. So I can see why some struggle and obviously every team's different. I know they can run uh, with quite a bit heavier steering. Um, you know, it's it's always a way from junior formula. Um, but no, it's it's it was okay to be fair. It was okay. The Formula Two, we had some tough moments. I remember Silverstone with when they brought out the 18-inch wheels. Uh I remember everyone coming in from qualifying and not being able to complete their fourth lap because no one could turn into the high speed corners. So IndyCar isn't that bad, but it's more prolonged. The race is longer, more pit stops, um, and just more flat out. Uh, so it wasn't a shock, but it was just a bit different for me. But yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough one, and the concentration as well, because like Formula Two, you're constantly looking after the tires, um, whereas IndyCar you can just go and push. So you, you've got to be on it all the time. And what's that like? I mean, when you drive the Pirelli tire, it's very much you've got to unravel the lock before you build the power. You can't attack the corner. You've got to roll some speed. You've talked about with great enthusiasm how different the Indy car is, and especially you know, and the Firestone tire. And how much are you having to adapt to that, or are you finding that you naturally you've got that in you, or or you're having to to go somewhere to find that new driving style? honestly it's it's different because i haven't ever been in a car like this like the the closest probably was the old formula three um that you could just push uh with the i think we had hanker tires but the the formula two you're very restricted uh even on the quality lap you don't want to slide you just want to get as much of it out as possible um so it is different in the formula one it's another level compared to everything on on one lap um but yeah, the way I describe it, it's just a go-kart. You can just push, push, push. Um, and it's funny when uh, I think one of the, the practices in Laguna, we weren't quick, um, but I, everyone who was going past me was just sliding and, you know, drifting through the corners. And I'm sat there going, am I missing something here? Is it like, do I need to be that on the limit um, through the corner to, to make it work? Um, and yeah, I think it's just a way to make the car go quicker. You have to be have to be sliding it the tires can take it to a certain extent and um yeah it's just about finding the limit of of what your car can do i think pato knows how to go sideways a lot every on board i see of him it's it's 
<laughs> properly on the limit. There you go. So you've been watching lots of onboards and, you know, testing's limited, but the, 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 the track time that you get over a weekend, especially with the tire allocations, fairly limited as well. That's going to be difficult for you over the first couple of rounds. Yeah, I think the good thing is I, I kind of got on well with the reds relative to the to the black. So that wasn't, it was quite nice to always get the the opportunities on the reds. Um, but the testing, I would say, it's because on some weekends you get two free practices in the qualifying, um, which is nice for me to learn the track. But like the first weekend I arrived, I had practice and straight into qualifying. And we had so many little issues that we were trying to figure out. And I remember going into the into the qualifying and we're just like, not the shift lights weren't even working in the qualifying. And you're like, oh man, you know, you need some time to build up and especially as a new team. So I think we've got all of that ironed out and we did after the first weekend, but you can imagine it's it was tough as a rookie uh, and with a rookie team to just go straight in and try and make it work. And last question with the ovals, they're so different to anything that the Europeans have ever raced on. Is there an element of trepidation or are you just looking forward to getting in the car and, and, and seeing how it works out? Look, I'll either love it or hate it. And I think you only hate it once you put it in the wall. Um, so for now, I love it. And yeah, it's it's probably quite a humbling um, experience. And everything I look at, because obviously, you know, being a young European driver, you go, oh, Oval's like, you know, who'd want to do them? And then you come and look at the the detail that goes into it and the tactics and everything it's it's crazy and i really have a, an appreciation for what these guys have done over the past well almost 100 years now um so yeah i, I think i'll go into it obviously with very little clue of what to do relative to to some of them but you've just got to experience it and get the most out of it and yeah i i think i should get on quite well uh i'm a bit you know sometimes uh uh the sense lacks and i can just push but you know you've got to bring it back at some point so that would be good fun i think i'm going to wrap that up jack callum pato you've been uh, it's been an honor to talk to you. you you're all supremely talented and we wish you from everyone at sky sports f1 all the success for 2022 thank you yeah thank you guys thank you very much thank you enjoy We'll hear more from drivers after the break and I'll look ahead to the season with the race.com's IndyCar expert, Jack Benyon. Jack, what a vintage year 2021 was, a season uh, of thrills and spills and ultimately not a surprise, Victor, but maybe not one that everyone had on the top of their betting sheet at the start of the season. What a performance, firstly by Chip Ganassi, but also Alex Pelot. Yeah, if you remember, there was all this uncertainty over Ganassi coming into the season. They had the Extreme E programme that they were starting and also the the IMSA sports car programme at the same time. So the kind of the questions in the off-season were, has, has Ganassi bitten off more than it can chew in this fight against Penske and, and Andretti? But actually, they came out with Alex Polo winning the first race and, and that really set the scene for the season. Like like the year before in, in 2020 when Scott Dixon won the first three races of the season, on the way to his title. So a bit of a bit of lineage there, but it was nice to see Alex Polo really deliver that opportunity that he'd been given. Chip Ganassi had spent, you know, quite a significant chunk of 2020 agreeing a deal with him and, and getting him on board and clearly had a lot of belief in him after his rookie season with Del Coin Racing. And yeah, it all came good. It was only a question of really, you know, previously we've had Scott Dixon and, and Joseph Newgarden kind of run away with a lot of championships and and you have that expectation that they're always going to be in the fight. But with someone like Alex Pelot coming along, you know, the, the question marks are always there. Is he going to be able to see this out? Is he going to be able to get to the end of the season and actually get the championship over the line? So we were kind of had this uncertainty, even though we knew Alex was good enough and that the team was good enough, that whether one of these big names like Newgarden, and Dixon, Herter and O'Ward also in the mix, whether they could storm up and, and steal it away from him at the last, especially after he had some late problems in the, at the end of the season as well. So it was a fantastic season and that kind of uncertainty over Alex not having won the championship before really made it even more exciting at the front. I think as the season went on, there was an element of this is impressive and Crikey's keeping it going. And, and then it was a case of surely not. And, and he just never looked to falter. He never, ever looked under pressure. And he seemed to treat the biggest days of his life during that season as though they were any other. He looked so cool, calm and collected. And I know that's a, a bit of a, a cliche, but 
his ability just to shut off from the occasion and focus on the process and, and not be flustered as well. When he wasn't winning, he was converting points. And it wasn't until there was that little wobble where the engine let go and, and various other things that, that, that you might have seen cracks in his armory, but they just never came. I think this is one of the the key things that we've seen and learned about Alex Pelo. And, and this was something that David Salters, who some Sky Sports F1 viewers might remember from managing Ferrari's engine program uh, in Formula One and is now the head of uh, HBD's efforts on the Honda side in, in IndyCar. And he said one of the main things that impressed him about Alex Pelo was his free headspace. You know, the 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 these things that champions have where they have so much space in their brain to think about things, you know, the actual driving is so little for them. You know what, you know, it requires so little thinking for them that they've got all this extra brain power to be thinking about the rest of the race. And I think it's easy to, to be blown away by people like Pato Ward and Colton Herzer when you see them drive because they're so spectacular. There's so much aggression and energy in their driving. You only need to watch an onboard to see that. But Alex is a lot more studious. Um, you know, when you watch his onboards, it looks a lot more kind of um, what maybe European fans would be more used to, you know, a more straight steering wheel and, and less fighting against the car, which is something that Alex likes. And clearly it proves that, you know, a lot of the publicity in IndyCar is about these new aggressive drivers coming through and about how the car has to be sideways and how it slides but it doesn't necessarily have to be an overly aggressive style because Alex Pelot has proven that with his, his championship win. And I think the level of consistency that he was able to bring to his season last year really showed his kind of professional studious approach really paid off for him. And um, yeah, I think we're just seeing all of the makings of a, a person who's able to win multiple championships because he's just got this consistency and this ability to deliver at the highest level repeatedly. And that's what's been so impressive about his rise so far. Yeah, I definitely uh, agree. Well, let's hear it from the man himself. Let's go to Alex Pillow. Yeah, it doesn't really change a lot. Let's say the mindset that I show up to to the race weekend. Uh, it's just better when 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 they introduce yourself and they call you a champion. But uh, the attitude they have going into the track, I still want to learn as much as possible from my teammates, Scott Dixon, TK, Jimmy Johnson, Marcus. Uh, try and and, and get uh, and maximize our opportunities, and and that's what we will do. Two or three weeks after the championship, I already raised it. Obviously, I'm super proud, super happy. I celebrate it with all my family, but um, but yeah, it starts again. Uh, we, we we will be forever champions of 2021. But uh, in order to continue being a champion, you need to win every single year. So. Um, that's what we will try to do. We've been working really, really hard um, and we'll continue working really hard throughout the season so so we can still call ourselves champions. So, Jack, do you think this is a changing of the guard? So often we talk about the Scott Dixons, the Joseph Newgardens, and of late, the Alexander Rossis. But going into 2022, on the tip of our tongues is Alex Pelot. Uh, Colton Herter, Pato Award, it, 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 and, and more. It, it's it's definitely looking that way, isn't it? They've definitely come in and impressed. And I think it's a little bit of what we were discussing before about this aggressive style that really appeals to people. Because when you watch it, you can't help but be impressed by the the, the level of ability that they blatantly show. Um, you know, from from any piece of footage that you watch, it's really impressive. So it helps that people like Pato, Colton, Alex are great characters as well, really entertaining people to listen to. And outside of the car, they're they're a lot of fun, and that's uh, another reason why they've had this kind of meteoric rise. I think it's because they're so media friendly and so. Um, you know, welcome in and they bought into this idea that IndyCar is, um, you know, one of the, the most difficult championships out there. It's one of the most competitive, but also outside of the, you know, when the helmet's off, it's a place where drivers can talk to each other about things that are going on and share advice and, and be quite honest with each other about what's going on, which obviously you don't get in a lot of championships. So it's, um, it's a real nice environment, especially for young drivers to come into and, and be met with when they've not experienced that before. So yeah, it's, that's, that's brilliant. I think the, the change in the guard is, is maybe, uh, I'm starting to believe that's happening now. I was a bit um, kind of cautious about that in recent years, because I think we've seen young drivers come in and have big results, but not necessarily put that together into a, you know, a championship run or be consistently threatening for the Indy 500, which are the two biggest things, you know, drivers need to do in, in IndyCar these days. But I think we are starting to get towards 
three or four young drivers now being genuinely in contention for for winning the 500 and, and winning the championship as well. So I think uh, I think we're definitely getting closer towards that change in the guard. But I've written extensively and wholeheartedly believe that Joseph Newgarden and Scott Dixon had much better seasons in 2021 than people have given them credit for and also should not be ruled out for 2022 because they're going to be right there. I think listening to Scott Dixon, he talks very much about just the little things not quite going his way. It's not a, a crisis. It's about continuing to do what he does well. He has reinvented himself over the years. That's what great champions do. They, they keep with the evolution. But it's just those nuances, those, those simple things that I think if the coin lands the other way up, Scott Dixon's not going anywhere. I think the, the thing that was different about Scott's season last year was that he wasn't consistently in with a chance of winning races, which is something unusual and something we've not really seen from him in recent years. So that was the disappointing factor. But if you look at it, like you said, it's a flip of a coin. If you look at it from the other side of the coin, I can tell you that Scott Dixon's average finishing position last year in 2021 was 0.13 worse than Alex Pelot, who won the championship. So that should tell you how close the championship is. It also tells you how weighted the Indy 500 is towards the championship because it's double points. So if you're Scott Dixon and you finish outside of the top 15 in the Indy 500, like he did last year, and if you're Alex Pelot finishes second in the Indy 500 with the double points, it's a massive boost. So the, the Indy 500 really is, it's not just the biggest race of the year. It's not just the thing that everyone wants to win. It, you know, it has a massive impact on the championship at the end of the year as well. And you could really start to get into dangerous territory of editing the championship once you uh, start looking at the Indy 500 and what's happened there and how much impact that has on the season. So, yeah, you're definitely right about Scott. He always has, you know, it's 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 silly to say that, that drivers have one focus in the off-season because that's never the case. There's always multiple things to work on. And I think like Jack Harvey has, has told Sky Sports F1 in, in the preview here that it's, you know, you're looking at, if you can make 10, 1% improvements, that gives you 10%, but no one's ever going to make a 20% improvement in one area. So that's what all the drivers are looking at. But Scott always does have one thing that is maybe slightly more important or something that gets just a tiny bit more of his time than some of those other things this season. It's working on the tyres. He feels like the his maybe his teammates who've come from a European background have had a bit of an advantage in adapting to, to the tyres on a, on a rough surface on, on road courses last season. And that's one of the places where he struggled. So as much as we talk about the likes of Alex Plow and Marcus Ericsson, the other teammate there at Chip Ganassi Racing, learning from Scott Dixon, this, you know, God-like six-time champion. It's It works both ways. He's going to learn something from how those guys prepare the tyres. And that's what's making Chip Ganassi such a strong operation at the moment is the, the level of experience and ability that they've got to tap from at the moment. All the greats do that. It's the Valentino Rossi effect. If you look at how Valentino Rossi changed his riding style over the years to fight the next great charge, uh, certainly Marquez. I mean, talking of Team Penske now, Joseph Newgarden finished second in the championship and all the talk for the first third of the season was Team Penske. I, you know, I forget the stat. It was eight races in. It was like their worst season for, for however many years, but still finished second. They've had a big change. They've lost personnel. They've strengthened as well in terms of the engineering department. But Joseph Newgarden looks his usual confident self. He says his confidence has never been higher going into this year and and i actually believe him he sounds convincing i agree i spoke to him yesterday and uh, i couldn't i don't think i've spoken to a more confident driver in in recent times to be honest he's absolutely fine with everything and like you said he's got some some adversity against him this year there's some changes in the engineering department over at penske and he's going to lose his his race engineer who's been with him since 2018 gavin ward who some people will know from, from his time at Red Bull. He worked in aerodynamics there and was a, a race engineer. Really cool story. So if you've not read about Gavin, it's definitely worth going to, to check out his story. But Joseph is going to be impacted by that. There's no, um, you know, there's no way you can cut this other than it being a loss for Joseph. And he accepts that, you know, that's, that is a fact. But, you know, he feels like every season he goes into where there's adversity or there's distractions or there's pressure. That's when he comes to the fore and that's when he's at his best. And we've seen this before. We've seen this when he had his new engineer back in, in 28, 2019, he won the championship um, when, when people had kind of judged that as something that was going to be a negative and something difficult for him to overcome. And, you know, he's, uh, he's expecting his first baby this year and that's going to be, you know, something that's going to be great for his family off the track and, and something that's going to be a really nice experience for him. But, you know, there's lots going on, um, as, as Joseph has said, and uh, I think that's really going to um, that's going to pile up on him. But as we've said, he's just one of those drivers who um, 
just when you write him off, just like Scott Dixon, just when you when you write these guys off and say it's not going to be their year and that they're going to have too much face in them, there's going to be too much trouble, there's going to be too much adversity. They come out fighting with both fists up and, and they'll win the first race or they'll be, you know, right there or thereabouts from, from the word go. And, you know, I've got no doubt in my mind, I accept that there's a lot of adversity against Penske this year, but in, in my mind, Joseph's going to be right there at the end of the season. There's no doubt about it. And again, when we come back to that, that average finish that, that I gave you earlier on Scott Dixon, Joseph Newgarden had the best best average finish of anyone in IndyCar who did the whole season last year. So when you look at things like that, you know, um, I appreciate you, you know what you were saying about the first half of the season at Penske. They didn't win a race, which was so unusual for them, but they felt like they were doing everything right and things just hadn't quite you know, clicked into place for them and it just wasn't quite, uh, you know, they weren't panicking about it and that's what makes them team Penske and, and one of the all-time greats. So I, I've got high expectations for that team this year and I know they've got high expectations of themselves as well. And another driver I want to mention because he's, and this will be controversial, but arguably the team leader of one of the other powerhouses, Andretti, it's Colton Herta. Now, Colton is somebody who has two speeds, flat out or stop. And I remember when I was working at Carlin in Europe and he was teammates to Lando Norris, his natural speed over a lap was, was unquestionable. And it put everyone in the shade. And Lando will talk about how much he learned from Colton around his natural speed. That hasn't changed. His speed is never in doubt, but there are elements of that approach that just need to be polished off if he's going to mount what I would say is a championship charge. Yeah, I think Colton's season last year was so complicated and I've read about this multiple times now, but you can go back and pick out five or six races where he did absolutely nothing wrong and he was taken out of the chance of, of winning a race. It was really disappointing for him. Remember the drive shaft at Gateway, for example, mid-Ohio where the, the fuel wasn't going into the car and the, there seems to be a bit of an issue with the, with the hose. Um, you know, some more obvious problems, but yeah, just loads going on behind the scenes there, um, just, just costing him a bit of time. I think, you know, when we talk about... we the one thing you hear about the IndyCar drivers at the moment is the level of the, the field is so high. Everything's so competitive. And we've heard that from the drivers on this preview already. And the one thing that makes Herta so impressive is that he's been the only one last year who was able to turn up at a weekend. You saw him drive in practice and you could tell he was going to be on pole. You could tell he was going to be there or thereabouts. And it was a good chance he was going to, going to win the race. I think he, I think he'd led all but two laps at St. Pete, the, uh, the second race of the season last year. And that was just an ultimate dominant performance. Nashville should have gone his way if, if the strategy in the race had been a bit more um, normal, let's say. Um, not normal for IndyCar because normally IndyCar strategy is wild. So normal would be, not be the right word in that context. But obviously he um, he crashed trying to, to catch Marcus Ericsson at the end of that race. And I think that's one of the things you're kind of alluding to where we're talking about him needing to refine his approach a little bit and, and become you know a little bit more consistent. But what I will say is with Colton Herter, there's... Uh, a track record you can go back and look at his his IndyCar career and see him improving things that have gone wrong in the previous season so his rookie season he was rapid won you know won um, in his rookie season and was uh, fighting for poles he was really peaky but the 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 inconsistency was obvious for, for everyone saying you know he's a rookie driver so that's fine but then 2020, he came back when the whole Andretti team was struggling with adapting to the aero screen, um, you know, the challenges that that brought to set up. And he delivered a phenomenally consistent season and was Andretti's best driver. And then for 2021, he wanted to work on his tyre management and his fuel management, did both of those fantastically in 2021. I just think you can see year to year that he's able to look at things that he's doing wrong and genuinely improve them, which a lot of drivers can't, you know, a lot of drivers can identify their weaknesses, but not can't always fix them. So the, the fact that Colton's visibly been able to do that throughout his career really shows what he's able to do at such a young age. You know, he's younger than some of the rookies that are coming into the IndyCar Championship this year and he's going into his third season. So. I know. I know. It's frightening, Four isn't it? Season. So it's crazy. I, I liken his speed advantage over the rest of the field to, to, the, to that of Max Verstappen as well. And the conversation's similar. Completely different personalities, don't get me wrong. Completely different different people but in terms of the way they drive the car what they're capable of doing when you look at what colton can do and like you say his dominance throughout a week is very max verstappen-esque and then everybody would talk about max having to tone it back and tone, and, and i've fallen into that trap with colton don't change a thing and uh and, and be the best that you can be and i, I can almost see colton on that same trajectory yeah, we discussed that about the, the incident in Nashville where, you know, he, you could see that his tyres were wearing and that he was good. there was a good chance he was going to crash. He tried to move uh, a lap or two before and it hadn't come off and it looked really sketchy at that point. And then he tried it again and put the car on the wall while he was 
while he was second. Now, let's not take anything away from Marcus Ericsson, who had a massive airborne crash at the start of that race and delivered arguably his best performance of his career. He'll tell you that himself, that it was definitely up there, or if not one of the best, to keep Colton behind him for the second half of the race. But Colton maybe. You know, I think this is a, another one of these coin flip situations you were talking about earlier, because at that point in Nashville, Colton wasn't really in the championship hunt and it looked like he was well out of it. So, you know, it came to him towards the end of the season when he, you know, he was winning races, you know, hand over fist towards the end of the season. You know, it looked like he was in championship contention by that point. But at Nashville, you know, things hadn't gone his way. There'd been a lot of adversity. And I think he just wanted to win a race just to end that bad luck streak that he'd been having or he felt he'd had. So I think there's two ways of looking at that. I don't necessarily think, you know, he'd thrown everything away just for the win. I think that was a, you know, a big opportunity for him to end that run of, you know, bad luck and, and disappointment and wasn't really thinking about the championship at that point because he did think he was going to be in it. And hindsight will tell you, obviously it could have worked a different way if he'd have maybe took the second at, at Nashville, he would have been able to put maybe a, a little bit more pressure on the championship and finished a little bit higher up, which incidentally would have been good for his super license points if he's looking good to, to go to Formula One in the future. But yeah, it's um, that's, that's a hindsight situation that I don't give him too much um, disservice for. I think he's also identified that race. Um, obviously he's looked back on that with, with his dad, Brian, who, who calls his strategy and has been on his radio in, in 2021. I know they're, they've learned their lessons from that, let's say, and I don't think that'll be a, a problem in the future. Another example of him being able to work on things that he's, uh, you know, identified as being weaknesses and, and fix them. Okay. Let's hear from those three drivers now. Last year was, was definitely a tricky year, I think for us and in many ways, and we lost a ton of points at, at, uh, at Indy, um, being double points, it's you know it's always hard. And I think with the the competition that we currently have, uh, to try and you know regain uh, deficits like that, that can be tough. But um, you know, kudos to the team. Team did a tremendous job uh, across all you know all cars. Um, so looking forward to, uh, to going into another season with you know a great shot at, at winning another championship. I understand what I need to do um, and what I need to work on. And you know, we had a really good meeting with the team about kind of everyone's job and, and what needs to happen, what needs to happen better. Um, and, you know, no one was selfish in that aspect of, of thinking of themselves and thinking, oh, I don't need to change. You know, everybody kind of brought up something good that, that they needed to do differently and better. Um, and so, you know, the team is really confident going into this year. And, and you know, I'm really confident in my in myself and my abilities and, and how the car has been, how our engine power has been in the last few years. Um, you know, I, I really think we have a championship winning season coming up and it's, it's very possible we have all the aspects together right now that, that we can do it next year. You know, last year was close again. You know, we, we look at 22 and 21 and both runner up finishes. Uh, proud of both efforts. You know, I felt like we put good campaigns together. Um, we gave ourselves opportunities to win, you know, championships over the last couple of years and they just fell short, unfortunately. You know, and you, you always hate that because it's such a, a commitment to run through these championships and, and put all your time, your energy, you know, and, and collaborate with all the people around you to, to really try and make it happen and, and ultimately be the winner at the end of the day. And we've, we've just fallen short. So, you know, all we can do is move forward. We, we've got to go to the next year and try and be better. And I think we've, we've all rallied this off season. Uh, we've looked at everything we can, you know, where can I be better? Where can we be better as a team? And where can we, you know, really challenge now um, for another championship? A lot of forms of motorsport just simply starts with being your teammate. You can't win the championship if you can't beat your teammate. Your teammate is the champion. Is that kind of where it starts again now? Absolutely. <laughs> Every year, whether whether you're the champion or you're not, you know, uh, last year doesn't count. You know, uh, it's it's nice to win championships. It's great to win championships. But again, you know, you start the season at zero, and and everybody has a fair shot at it. So, you know, uh, I think for our team, you know, it's been great for for team morale with you know the wins that we had across you know all the cars last year. Um, you know, to to capture another championship with with Alex and the ten car crew did a, a tremendous job, uh, as expected, and and, and as they had done many a times before. So, um, you know. I'm looking forward to it. You know, uh, I don't think anything you know really changes on that front. You know, I think having the inner team competition is is extremely important. And and you know, uh, I think last year it was definitely, you know, taken up a step. Um, you know, from the other cars. So uh, hopefully that pushes us in the same direction. And ultimately, uh, hopefully we can win you know another championship for for Chip. There's definitely areas that I can improve with in in my driving. Um, you know, as always. Um, but maybe there's some stuff in my personality where like places like Nashville where I might have overreacted and got a little too hot. Um, you know, 
maybe there's there's places in qualifying where um, I made too much too many mistakes in this one corner um, that I can think of, and it kind of kind of hurt me. Um, so yeah, and I think just understanding that it's okay to finish where we're gonna finish. Um, and that's something that I brought over from 2020, which I think I did a lot better about this year, um, but still need to improve on. We definitely are gonna have new faces in the building. We're gonna have some rotation um, with personnel and it's, it's gonna be a little different look for us, but and I think we're gonna have a really tight group, a focused group. Um, a more nimble group, if you will, and I feel good about it. You know, we've got some of the best people in the world working on our team, and we collaborate so well together. We've got great drivers. Um, we're all pulling in the same direction, and, you know, I feel like we can make any situation work. I always believe that. Um, even if it's not working in the beginning, we'll figure out a way to make it work. So the idea is to be, you know, hitting the ground running as best we can, and if it's not where we need it to be, we'll figure out how to get it there. I think what IndyCar's done with the rules and, and you know there's not really much that you can do with the cars or even you know the level of testing is, is so limited now that you know uh, everybody has a has a great shot uh, at winning the championship so um, you know I think that's that's perfect that's what you know all the all the viewers want to see and, and and the people that love IndyCar racing um, you know it's going to come down to a, a tight championship as we as we typically do. Staying on the Andretti Autosport theme, one of the most popular stories of last year was Roman Grosjean's transition to IndyCar, and this year sees him joining Andretti Autosport. But did the success of last year and the reaction from fans surpass his expectations? Oh, yes, there were definitely a lot of um, unknown coming into the States. I didn't know if it was going to like, you know, the series being in the States for so much, um, the championship, the races. Um, I didn't know if I was going to do ovals or not. So yes, there was a lot of things that I didn't really know when I came here last year. Also, having done Formula One for 10 years, you know, you've got a certain reputation. So whenever you do something new, there's the risk that things may not work and then, you know, reputation can go um, can go down. So I guess there were, there were some risks. Um, that's what I, only signed one year and, and I didn't move my family for the 2021 season but uh, very quickly in the season I realized that that was going to be something that I would enjoy and um, and we got ready very uh, very early in the year last year to um, actually move in the States as, as the full family and uh, go racing full time. Was there a race or a moment or something that helped make that decision for you or was it just you finally had the, the feeling that this was no, I think I had the feeling very early on last year that that's where I wanted to be. And, and after St. Pete, only two races into the championship, I flew back home and I just knew that there was something going on and, and I liked it. I loved it. So then, you know, my family came and, and spent the summer uh, with me in the bus uh, through the Midwest. And I could tell that they were really happy being here. And that just triggered everything. Then we found a school for the kids, found a house and moved in at the end of December in, in Florida. And we're just loving it. So Jack, Roman Grosjean's successful transition to the United States of America and IndyCar racing has been one of the biggest stories of 2021. And it looks set to get even bigger for 2022. And he doesn't look phased by that pressure. He looks excited. Yeah, absolutely. He looks uh, almost exactly as he did last year, this refreshed Roman Grosjean that none of us really recognised from his time in, in Formula 1. A totally different character. You know, the fans have fallen in love with him, giving him fireman t-shirts and things like this. He's really bought into his nickname, the Phoenix, after his crash in, in Bahrain. And yeah, just a really refreshing to see a driver who, you know, has, has pummeled away at the back end of the grid in, in Formula 1 for so long, just have that refreshing opportunity to, to come in and impress Big, big credit to, to Dale Coyne Racing. You know, such a uh, an underfunded operation compared to some of the bigger teams out there. They've done a lot with European drivers before coming over from from the likes of the, the single-seater ladders that we know and, and love in Europe. So, uh, you know, they're just showing there that the when the right people are in place uh, that you could do so much. And, and Roman really impressed to the point of... To the point of where... He's gone into get to Andretti where people are asking what can Roman learn from Colton Herter, Alexander Rossi, um, you know, the, the the guys in the team there. And in actual fact, those guys are wondering what they can learn from Roman, especially with his breaking, because his overtaking 
you know, became a bit of a trend. Um, I'm sure people will have seen on social media some of his, uh, you know, crazy bonkers overtakes from last season with Dale Coyne. And they, you know, the Andretti guys want to replicate his braking and what he's been able to do with the car. So that's been a real theme of the off season, not just for the drivers, but for the team and Dretti trying to learn about what, um, you know, what Roman Grosjean was trying to do with the car, what Olivier Boisson, his engineer from Dale Coyne, who's gone with him to Andretti, what they can bring to the team and, and how they can adapt Roman Grosjean's setup into Andretti. Because as we know, you know, IndyCar is a, a kind of a, a war in the background, let's say the, the chassis is spec, but things like dampers are free and, the, the whole car is geared towards a certain philosophy that you can't just change overnight or race to race. So adapting Roman's setup and, and how he likes to break into the car is not going to be a case of him coming in and changing a couple of settings. It's going to be, how do we work this into the overall Andretti setup? Obviously they've got loads of simulation that it can do that tells them what's the best way to set the car up. And then you have to marry that with making sure the driver's happy with it and is able to extract the maximum out of it. So that's going to be a big topic of the, the early 22 part of the season is, um, you know, how they all mesh together. A lot of big kind of, I don't like to use the word egos because I don't think that's necessarily the case with this lineup, but a lot of big names, who will be expecting to win races and fight for the championship. So that's going to be an interesting situation to see how those drivers are managed together in that team. And yeah, obviously we've got Roman coming in to do his first Indy 500, which is going to be a massive story because we didn't really get the, the whole Alonso factor in the Indy 500 last year, but this year we're going to have seven time NASCAR champion, Jimmy Johnson, and we're going to have ex Formula One driver, Roman Grosjean, making their Indy 500 debuts, which is going to be such a massive storyline going into that event. And hopefully something that is going to draw in a lot of extra fans, both from the NASCAR side of things, but also, you know, from, from Roman and his Formula One past. Hopefully that's going to bring a lot more people to watch the Indy 500 next year. I think he's really embraced the American way, hasn't he? He's moved his family over to Florida. They're settling in. He's talking about playing uh, in the cage, baseball, that kind of stuff. Very much reminiscent of, of the late Dan Weld and Dario Frank. It's Europeans who have come over and embraced the American way. And the Americans absolutely love that together with those Europeans that, that show the speed, the tenacity and the fight that Romain Grosjean has shown. That, for me, you know, he's going for, from strength to strength. As you say, they're giving away the T-shirts and, and, and they're almost adopting him, so to speak. It's lovely to see off the back of what was such a challenging end to his, his Formula 1 career. Where does this put Alexander Rossi? Because he's been under pressure the last two seasons and again, it's been fine margins and he's been there and thereabouts, but it, it, he just can't grab a break and then one or two mistakes. But now he has an extra thorn in his side and that's going to take some managing, like you said. Yeah, I feel like we've kind of been digging at Alexander Rossi for a little while now and it's not out of, you know, if anything, it's out of admiration because we expect so much from him. We expect such performances, such a high caliber of, of deliverance from him that we haven't seen over the last two years. You know, he's not won a race for two seasons and that's, you know, that deserves a certain level of criticism. It was unimaginable. Because... If you'd have said that to me three seasons ago, you, you, you couldn't have imagined that. Well, he was the biggest driver on the driver market. You know, Penske were looking at him. There was a bit of a war going on in the background there as to where he was going to end up. And, you know, we, we've gone from that to him not even being the, the top driver in his own team now. So it's a, it's, it's a massive year for him. I agree. Um, you know, there's going to be two thorns in his side, arguably there with Colton and, and Roman, if he's able to get up to speed quickly. So two very, very strong drivers that he's going to have to contend with. But also there's the the question of his future with his contract ending at the end of the season. Again, like he was a few years ago, he's going to be a big name on the drive market and he knows he needs to deliver this year if he's going to, you know, either get his want of staying at Andretti or if he's going to have some conversations with some other teams, which we've heard as potentially already happening already um, and, and whether he's going to move on. You know, the only way I think he gets what he really wants in this situation is if he delivers a really strong 2022. And they put all the work in in the background. Um, again, the the guys at Andretti working really hard to, to work with Alexander and give him everything he needs. He felt like he had, you know, a, a pretty good season last year and, that you know, he'd done most of the things he could do from his side. It was more things out of his control that were affecting his season. But yeah, there's no doubt there that, you know, and not once did we see the level of dominance that Colton Herter was able to bring three or four times to the to the table last year um, and, and a lot more consistently over the course of the season as well. So it's a massive year for Alexander Rossi and he doesn't need 
me to sit here and tell him that we expect him to be winning races because that's what he expects of himself and that's what you know everyone's going to be looking for to happen this year. Now we've touched on Arrow McLaren SP strengthening with Gavin Ward making a charge for the top five. Let's talk about Rahul Letterman Lanigan expanding to three cars. They've got a young charger could you know set the world alight on his first qualifying session in IMS last year on the road course, could do Alex Pillow, Pato Award style things in that RLL car. And then you've got Graham Rahal, who's obviously the master tactician, keeps those tires alive. And Jack Harvey, who was so strong in qualifying last year, and this is arguably his big moment. There's a big argument to say that RLL are going to be in the top five and can really challenge uh, Victory Lane for Victory Lane as well. Well, Tom, you know how much I like my numbers and the Ray Hall team, the top three cars, the the two cars that they ran full-time and the third car that they mostly ran for Santino Ferrucci. If you average the finishes across Andretti, Penske and Ganassi's cars and then do the same for Ray Hall, they had a better average finish um, you know, if you if you equate that down. So really impressive season last year. A big part of that was Graham Rahal improving his average finish by like four positions per race, which was massive for the team. I really think he should have been in championship contention. And, uh, you know, I won't declare he should have won the championship because he wasn't really in contention to win races. And we know if you're going to win an IndyCar title, really you need to be winning three races a year or it's not going to happen. So, you know, he was never going to be the champion, but I think there's a, a, a strong argument that he could have been in the top five if more things have gone his way. He had a lot of adversity in the first half of the season that was, you know, nothing to do with him, him being taken out of races or or things going wrong. And then the wheel literally came off his Indy 500 charge where, you know, he felt like he was going to win that race uh, and that it was obvious. Um, so really, really strong season for him, I thought. And if he can bring any sort of and, you know, even near that to, to this season, it's going to be a big deal. Obviously, you mentioned Jack Harvey and we've spoke to him already. I think he just needs to go out and prove now that he can win races and, and fight at the front because he's done that partially with my shank racing before, but now he's got a, a top team and he's got the opportunity to go in there. I think Ray Hall will be looking for him to improve their qualifying form because that's something that Jack historically has been, you know, very good at. And then there's this young whippersnapper, Christian Lungard, coming into the mix from F2 and made his debut in, in IndyCar last year, qualified fourth on his debut on the Indy road course, which was just baffling. It was incredible. And he, without, I spoke to him earlier in the offseason and he didn't want to sound offensive to, to Graham and his then teammate Takuma, but he said he couldn't believe that the rest of the cars weren't closer to him and, and further up there because the car felt so good. And then after that, they broke down the data and worked out that Christian was doing something different with his driving style. And they passed that on to Graham and, and Takuma. So I think you can see from that, although Christian's season might be less consistent than, than Jack's or Graham's, there's definitely going to be some star performances there. There's going to be some big runs and he's going to help out Jack and Graham massively, I think, in the background there, if not, you know, being contention himself. So I think that's a really strong lineup. And I think people are sleeping on that team if they think it's not going to be fighting for wins at some point this season. Well, Jack, your insight and knowledge is second to none. Before we go, I'm going to hold you to a near impossible question. Who's your favourite for the 2022 title? We've actually been doing this. Uh, we do a feature every year for the race where we have our contributors talk about the, uh, you know, who's going to be the champion at the end of the year. And I always wait till last and end up um, realising that so many people have gone for the same person and then going for a slightly left field option. But this is a welcome opportunity to go for who I think is going to win. I think it's going to be Joseph Newgarden personally. Um, I think he's the most complete driver in the championship personally. That's my opinion uh, from, from what I've seen and, and from covering the championship. And I feel like um, with, um, with a, a stronger Penske at the Indy 500, uh, I think they, they might have had more championships and would have been in a much better position, you know, over the last two years. So, I think he's going to be the man to watch. We've talked about the fact that he loves this adversity and he loves, you know, he really delivers when the pressure's on and people are, you know, people aren't looking at him or people aren't taking him seriously. So I think he's going to storm through and, and take the championship, but could be any one of six or seven drivers. So uh, Tom, who's yours? Yeah, it's a really difficult one. I think you've stolen one of my favourites from the from the tip of my tongue. Joseph does look the, the, the complete package. It all depends on how quickly Team Penske can can get the car out of the the, the truck. I'd I'd love to say uh, Colton Herter as as an outsider. Um, I, I would absolutely love to see Colton mount a really serious title challenge. And what I mean by that is taking it right to, to the final wire. He's really quick 
around St. Pete's as well. So he can get off to a, a good start there, then anything's possible. The big question mark, of course, is over the pace of the Andretti Autosport cars on the ovals. We only go to three ovals, I think it is, but you know, you've got to score well at the 500. So that that's a big question mark. Um, Alex Pelot, back-to-back championships. That would be great, wouldn't it? We'll yeah, it'd be, that, that would be interesting to see. And I think with Andretti as well, it's their permanent road course form as well that they've been working really hard in the off-season to try and fix because, you know, Colton might, you know, kind of um, drive past some of these problems that they have sometimes, but they, they definitely have a little bit of an underlying problem on the permanent road courses. So that'll be something to, to look out for, something that Ganassi's been so good at. Well, thank you very much for your time, Jack Benyon. We're all looking forward to St. Petersburg and, of course, this 2022 uh, IndyCar season that will be live for you for the entirety on Sky Sports F1. It's bye for now.